What's one of the best movies made during World War II? I'd argue it's the English comedy slash romance by the great British team of filmmakers Pal and Pressburger. It's I Know Where I'm Going, which came out in 1945. Let's see what this movie's about, why you should watch it, and let me argue for it, coming up next. <laughs> So you probably know that Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger, who made the Archer movies, are very famous and influential. If you're watching Martin Scorsese movies, for example, Scorsese loves the Archers. I think their best movie during World War II, maybe besides the life and death of Colonel Blimp, is I Know Where I'm Going. What's great about Powell and Pressburger during World War II, you know, is that they made propaganda movies for the English government. However, you can detect the messages in these movies as English propaganda, but they do come off to me as complex artwork unlike almost all propaganda. Now that's different from their movie 49th Parallel which is about Nazis invading Canada and going all the way across Canada, a movie I find unintentionally funny. But then they made The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, A Canterbury Tale, and then in 1945 they made this great romance, I Know Where I'm Going. This is certainly a date movie if either you or your partner or spouse really enjoy older movies. The movie takes place, as I said, during World War II, and it focuses on a British woman named Joan Webster. She's a go-getter, she's the title character, and the movie claims, with tongue-in-cheek, she always knows where she's going. The joke's gonna be on her throughout the movie. Now, at the beginning of the movie, she's going to marry a British chemical magnate. He's the head of a British chemical corporation, and the movie actually makes fun of her and says, actually, she's marrying a corporation. Do you, Joan Webster, take consolidated chemical industries to be your lawful wedded husband? I do. She's going to be married on the Scottish island of Kilorin, a tiny island in the Hebrides. And this British chemical magnate has rented the island, basically. So she undertakes a journey at the beginning of the movie and goes from stage to stage, from town to town, on the rail and then on boat to get to this tiny remote island of Kilorin. Now, on the next to last stage, right before she gets to Kilorin, she's stopped. You can't make it to Kilorin because it's a huge gale, the waves are too massive, and the boat cannot go from one island to Killorn, her final stop. So she's got to wait it out. Now, as she's waiting it out, she meets another man. And with me saying that, and you know this is a romance, you might imagine what happens. Well, this man, as it turns out, is actually the Lord of Killorn. He's on leave from World War II as a soldier going back to Killorn for a week's leave. And he helps her out first by telling her, you know, you can't go to the island, you can't risk your life by going on boat, you're going to die if you try to get to Killorn. So then they start bumming around around this other island together and she gets to know the local culture which is eccentric and weird. It's farm based, it's rural, and it's different than what she's used to. This movie is broken up into three parts. The first part is the travels of Joan Webster to this island and then she's annoyed that she can't get to Killorin. The second part is her bumming around with the Lord of Killorin and they don't seem to like each other very much at times but then of course they begin to like each other and then they want to separate because they can feel it out that they actually really like each other. In the third stage, the third part of this movie, as you might imagine, are these two getting together. That's not a spoiler alert, you knew this coming into this video. First, great performances here by Wendy Hiller, who plays Joan Webster, and the always great Roger Livesey, who was also in Pal and Pressburger's Life and Death of Colonel Blimp. Second, great local color in this movie. I really enjoy the sort of promotion and praise of local Scottish culture. Pal and Pressburger love to add in flair and all kinds of extra little things that make a movie very rich. In this case, they've got a man who has a golden eagle for a pet, and then the farmers and the hunters try to hunt this eagle down because they think the eagle is killing off their livestock. There's also a haunted castle that the Lord of Killorn is not supposed to go into. Supposedly there's an ancient curse, and if the Lord of Killorn goes into it, he will be cursed for life. Well, you might imagine that the Lord of Killorn in this movie is going to walk into that castle at some point. The movie obviously contrasts a female go-getter, a woman of the city, with local bumpkin culture. Now you might ask, why is this a propaganda movie? How does this promote the English government during World War II? First, this movie is very heavily arguing for unity within the United Kingdom. And that's not overt, but you do get that with the relationship between this English woman and this Scottish island male. 
And here's a pro tip whenever you have a woman who represents one type of person and a man who represents another type of person and they represent national identities and they get married, we're not just talking about two people getting together in a relationship, we're talking about two national or ethnic identities unifying. You'll see this a lot in movies and literature, period. If you have two characters unite and get married and the whole goal of the story is for them to get married, it's usually arguing for some kind of national, ethnic, economic, or whatever unity between two different types. And that's exactly what's going on in this movie. It makes fun of the woman, Joan Webster's, getting married to a chemical corporation and instead she should get married to local tradition and local culture represented by the Lord of Killoran. Now there are two sequences of just tremendous montages. I think Michael Powell probably has, of all filmmakers, the best montages, arguably so. And you see it early in the movie with this Joan Webster character trying to travel to Kaloran, some fabulous sequences of travel, and it's mixed with satire and with lots of interesting dissolves and other kinds of shot making that make all kinds of political and social points and with the artistic flair typical of Powell. Near the end of the movie, you have a boat journey, and that too has some fabulous shot making, some fabulous sequences in it. What makes this movie art, I think, is that it's making all kinds of statements, one, about male and female relationships and male and female psychology circa 1945. Second, it's making political statements about the United Kingdom in general, as I said. It's also very clearly making economic statements. You know, this woman is going to marry a giant corporation and be fabulously rich for life, but what is the alternative to marry the local culture, to marry the local tradition, represented by the Lord of Killorn, who tells this woman, you know, these people are poor, but they really don't care about money. That may or may not be true, but when she marries the Lord of Killorn, she's marrying a land and a tradition, and not necessarily the money as represented by the chemical corporation. People around here, are they poor, I suppose? Not poor, they just haven't got money. It's the same thing? Oh no, something quite different. And I think you could argue that this movie takes a traditionalist view of things. You can either marry into and appreciate the modern world, which is the chemical corporation, the fast trains that Joan Webster is on early in the movie, or the local slow culture that you see at the end of the movie, where people fish for salmon, where people hunt for birds, where life is slower, and maybe duller to most people, but it has a local flavor on the island of Kaloran and in the surrounding settings. This movie, like Powell and Pressburger's last movie, A Canterbury Tale, is promoting British traditionalism, which I think is a part, in fact, of the war movement, a pro-British effort to say, we're great peoples, we always have been, Let's continue to fight with the Nazis. And you know, there's a catch in this movie. Even if the Lord of Killoran marries Joan Webster or gets together with her, he's going to have to go back and fight in World War II. Here's a spoiler alert. Of course, they do get together at the end of the movie. I find although this movie has a happy ending, you have to think the Lord of Killoran's going back to the war. What if he dies? Well, we never got a sequel, so we don't actually know. And as I said, if you need a date movie to please your girlfriend or wife or spouse, this might be a good older movie to choose. If you've seen this movie, what do you think about it? What do you think about my interpretation of it? Let us know in the comments. Please subscribe to this channel as well for more great movie content. Thank you. Have a great day.